Dudes, it is my rich desire to talk to you about The Wind in the Willows and what The Wind in the Willows is actually about. And I can do so rather superficially, suggesting a structural way of looking at stories that will change, I think, how you read a lot of stories, particularly older ones. And if you are one who writes, uh, maybe making you reevaluate some of that. So the question is, what is the wind in the willows about? The shortest answer possible is the wind in the willows is about the wind in the willows. But let's start from the beginning. So. Okay, so here we have a typical plot structure as modern and contemporary teachers uh, like to explain it to us. A three-act structure. There is an inciting incident, rising action, a climax, and then descending action, falling action, the resolution of the story. So the climax is the key, a Western orgasmic approach to writing. Okay, so the rise to the climax and then the close. One, two, three, that is the typical structure. And here in this graphic I'm showing you, uh, it's actually you know pretty detailed. Beginning, inciting incident, second thoughts, moments of doubt, right? The climax of act one, obstacle, obstacle in the ascending action, a big twist, and so on. Uh, but of course, uh, we can render this much more simply. We don't even need, oops, uh, we don't even need to have something as detailed as this, but this is much simpler, right? The three act structure, the setup, the confrontation, the resolution, woo, the rising action and the crisis. This is what's important. Now, if you read, uh, the wind in the willows, then, well, what is the crisis? What is the climax? Is it the fight for Toad Hall? It, it doesn't feel quite right. So here are the chapter titles for the wind in the willows. Okay, the riverbank, the open road, the wild wood, Mr. Badger, and so on. That odd chapter, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn, all the way down to like Summer Tempest Came as Tears and the Return of Ulysses, which is, of course, you know, the, the, the fight for Toad Hall being compared to Ulysses' return uh, to, um, to his home, right? Uh, and uh, his slaying of all of the suitors. He comes back in, in humility, disguised as a beggar, and then slaughters all of those who dared suppose he had been dead. Now, a little side note, like Summer Tempest Came as Tears, is actually from a Tennyson poem, but it's like Summer Tempests Came Her Tears. So there's definitely a little play here uh, with uh, the, the manliness uh, of of this battle of the of the fight and of, of Mr. Toad himself. Anyway, these are the chapter titles. Now, if we look at the themes uh, of this book, uh, I think that we can see that the themes are so. The way I've looked at it, as we look at the themes as they're outlined. Uh, in the chapters, we have home, we have overwhelming adventure, we have a quest being on the road, and we have misadventure. But you'll notice that I've laid it out in a certain way, in a chiastic structure, a chiasmus. Okay, so this cross-shaped literary structure, I've talked about it elsewhere. Um, you can find just a, a myriad of materials online about this stuff. One can get a little, little exaggerated, and you should take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, but I think that you're going to find this. Actually, it's quite uh, quite an illuminating way to look at, look at things. So, 
Uh, what I mean by chiasm is that we, what we have here are parallels and parallels that ripple out. So for example, the theme at the beginning of the book, I would say, is home. And the theme at the end of the book is home. The next theme uh, to be approached is overwhelming adventure, where there, there is overwhelming adventure, adventure that is just too much, uh, just before the home part at the end as well. So you can see it all funnels in. That's why I've given it this shape and even called them things like A, A prime, B, B prime. So the structure is home, overwhelming adventure, a quest being on the road, a uh, thematic structure, right? Misadventure and toad. And then again, misadventure and toad, a quest being on the road, overwhelming adventure and home. Now this sort of parallelism can definitely create something that feels static when compared to that wee ascending action climactic resolution, right? Um, it's almost like if you read The Wind in the Willows, you might wonder to yourself, why does this feel so episodic? Uh, and you might even have thought, well, you know, the, the episodic nature of this actually contributes to the feeling of, of, of calm and stability, that even in the face of some pretty ugly things, uh, you know, it's not just because it's beasties, um, and we're not even going to approach the human world and some of the themes that uh, that uh, uh, ugly themes uh, that are approached in the, in the second half of the book, but we want us to keep this relatively simple. Okay, well, what's missing from this chiastic structure? It's the thing in the middle. Now, chiasms always have that A, A prime, B, B prime, the sort of cross shape, okay, that intersecting shape. Um, there's not always something explicitly in the middle, but the thing that the chiasm should make you do is look for the middle. Okay. And th there are, ca there are chiasms out there that are in the middle down to the letter in Hebrew. Okay. Down to the line. Uh, so this is something that, that you can look at it very technically if you wish. Um, but I'm not saying that you look right at the middle of the book, right? But you look in the middle thematically. Now, uh, you know, as it happens, it is more or less in the middle of the book. But the piper at the gates of dawn, the wind in the willows, the weirdest part of the wind in the willows is the piper at the gates of dawn. And the piper at the gates of dawn is what it's all about. And this leads to all sorts of comparisons, I think. Um, this may make us want to explore uh, the use of fairy in the second half of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century to create a sort of British nationalism. Um, one of the things that mentioning this always uh, brings up with people uh, is Tom Bombadil, right? And 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 Tolkien's outrageous statement uh, that you know, and, and others saying saying something similar that that Tom Bombadil is the most important, the most powerful, like the, or even that that the, the the trilogy is really about Tom Bombadil is right there at the beginning, All right? So thematically often the things that that don't quite fit so when i say you know the piper at the gates of dawn doesn't fit and that's what it's about people say oh tom bombadil but you know think about where tom bombadil is in that story right at the beginning right the shire tom bombadil what happens at the end of the war of the rings you have the scouring of the shire you have this thematic connection, okay? The beautiful and terrible, and the ugly and terrible, right? But you have this thematic connection and it brackets, right? So at the beginning and at the end, the War of the Rings is not ruled by that climactic, uh, you know, these things that we feel don't fit. Well, why don't they fit? Well. How is the author structuring the thought and the work of art itself? So when you read The Wind in the Willows, or you watch one of the movies, 
The best one, in my opinion, is the stop motion. And the, it's the best one for the Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Um, I think that you'll find that your reading of that book absolutely changes when you have a clear understanding that the, the author structurally wanted to make you focus on that weird part of the story. That's not the only weird part, but it is the most terribly fey weird part, the deeper magic weird part, the deepest weirdness, the Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Anyway, it's a fun book. If you've never read it before, you're now better equipped to go after it. It's a quick read, so I recommend it to everyone. The peace of Christ be upon you. What day is it today? Remind me. Uh, it's Sunday, Mr. Pench. Sunday. And what do we do on a Sunday morning, wherever we happen to be? We go to church, you bloody heathen!